1996 rolled around and it really was Robert Shaw's final chance. He had no excuses to miss the finals this time. He had Modra, Rashuto, Smart, both Jarmans, Bickley and Hart, among other quality players, even if Sean Wren was falling to pieces every single time he wore the tricolours. They started well, beating the eventual minor premiers in round one. The Germans combined to kick the most amount of goals between brothers since the Coventries of the 1920s in round two. The Crows were leading the ladder after round four and had won six of their first eight, with Ben Hart's mark of the year in round eight being the highlight of an impressive opening stanza. However, they crumbled, losing five in a row and then all but two of the last 14, with one of those wins being an absolute gimme against a dying Fitzroy. The club Shaw himself had helped to kill, sticking the dagger in further with a 14 goal second term. One of only five times a club has ever had such a quarter in 150 years of the Australian Football League. It was a truly great performance, but look at what surrounded it. It clearly wasn't good enough. Shaw was given the sack, deservedly, becoming the only Crows coach to coach multiple seasons and never make the finals. His replacement, none other than AFL Hall of Famer Malcolm Blight, was fresh off three grand finals with Geelong. Well, he lost all of them, but anyway. He began his tenure as a new ruler by completely erasing links to Glory's past. Andrew Jarman, that slick veteran with ball movements second to only his brother Darren, was unceremoniously cut. Joining him in unemployment was Vice-Captain Tony McGuinness, Adelaide's first goal scorer and 1993 best and fairest. The final royal figure to fall was Chris McDermott, encouraged into retirement a month shy of his 33rd birthday, having only managed nine games in 1996. This raised a huge issue. How do you fill this massive gap in experience and talent? Initial Crow Mark Bickley was appointed as the next captain, which solved one issue. As for the other issues, well, in the trade period, Blight answered them with a man who had six disposals combined in his final two Collingwood games, two men who couldn't get a game at 14th place to Melbourne, a kid so small that if he was a fish you'd throw him back, the brother of someone good who I can only assume was recruited through mistaken identity, a forward who managed half a goal a game in the freaking 90s, and a bloke so bad he hasn't even got a Wikipedia page. It was like a sale at a dime store. Blight went berserk. Compounding this was one of the weakest drafts in AFL history. The best player in the draft was either Byron Pickett or Russell Robertson, and even they were both very sporadic and phenomenally late picks at that. The next best was a three-way tie between Michael Gardner, Jason Johnston, and a random plank of wood. Adelaide's contribution to this 1996 Cirque de Dismay was recruiting Tom Gilligan in the first round. He was so bad that after his three appearances in 1997, he never graced an AFL field again. Chad Rintoul and Andrew Eccles rounded out Adelaide's night along with a couple other guys who were never really heard from again. Combined, these 13 men Blight picked up would barely limp to the combined games figures of the three they replaced and would be thrashed in most other statistics. Didn't look good for 1997. Plus, there was a new contender throwing their hat into the ring. The Port Adelaide Magpies had finally got their AFL bid together, and the new, renamed for legal reasons Power, was set to face the Crows early on. Animosity was at an all-time high, as the SANFL's relevance was at an all-time low. This year saw the first drop in Crows member numbers, albeit a slight drop, and was probably caused by whatever the loaf of bread had done to the team in 1996. Round 4 loomed as the big showdown, and the Crows went in with a lot of undeserved confidence, which quickly drained as Port's magpie-sourced power lineup made mincemeat of the Crows physically. It was an embarrassment. Darren Mead, on his way to being the only AFL novice to ever win a Best and Fairest, killed the Crows' forward line, earning the three Brownlow medal votes. The only Crows to score multiple goals were Rintoul with two, and Modra with a remarkable seven. In fact, Godrick was the only player not to be outscored by the incredibly awful Ian Downsborough, who deceived Adelaide with his skills so much that they recruited him at the end of the year, which went about as well as Adelaide's 1996 recruiting wave. So by the end of round four, it was all looking pretty messy. No, not that sort of messy. But a big win over Essendon in round seven, led by big Matty Robran, paved the way for a five-game winning streak and sparked season-long changes in his teammates. 
Mark Rusciuto exploded onto the scene in his new midfield role, earning 18 Brownlow votes. Tony Modra saw off challenges from Sav Rocker and Jason Heatley, gee there's a shock, to win Adelaide's first and likely only ever Coleman medal, which wasn't even the greatest thing he did that year. Darren Jarman somehow went to 21 disposals and 2 goals a game. Kim Costa had easily the best season of his short career. The Crows made their second final series, but no one really expected them to do anything this time. They finished fourth. Well done. They had the Coleman medalist. Bravo. But no Victorians and few South Australians thought the Crows had it in them to go all the way. After their first match was shifted back for some dead princess or something, they accounted for Blight's old foe the Eagles easily enough, with Bickley and Modra starring. Their semi-final against Geelong, though, was less straightforward, and not just because two future Crows coaches were on the Cats' team sheet. Geelong took a three-goal lead in the quarter time that the Crows rapidly pegged back, with an almost goal-for-goal -goal second half ending eight points in Adelaide's favour, slightly ruined by a controversial umpiring mistake which cost the accurate Lee Colbert to show a goal. Troy Bond began a finals run of unlikely heroes, booting three goals for the game. The next game was perhaps the greatest in Adelaide's history to that point. Against a strong Bulldog side with legends such as Liberatore, Johnson, Hudson, Grant, Darcy and West, the Crows again let an early lead to its opposition slip, but this time it was of their own making. The Crows had four more scoring shots than the Dogs in the first term, but missed all seven that they took. What they needed was Tony Modra, but cruelly he injured his ACL in the first quarter. Ben Hart shifted forward in a rare forward line cameo, kicked five behinds, while the very mediocre James Cook managed six goals up the other end. It was Kane Johnson and a young Andrew McLeod who stood up and provided Darren Jarman, Rod Jamison and Nigel Smart with the delivery they needed to boot the last four goals of the game to down the dogs in a two-point thriller. This brought the underrated, ragtag, 13-win Crows up against Brownlow medalist Robert Harvey's 15-win, ladder-leading Saints in the Grand Final, a team Adelaide had only just accounted for with a home ground advantage earlier on in the season. It was going to be tough, but those brave lads who'd fought so hard against the Bulldogs, and indeed for the whole year, deserved to play next week. Not all of them did, though. Trent Ormond Allen had played well all year in Adelaide's half-back line, to many surprise. He'd won 11 of his last 13 games, he was a good luck charm if anything else, until he came down with glandular fever during grand final week. Mark Rusciuto, their standout player, came down with a season-ending injury in round 22, and so the man who sat fourth in the Brownlow medal had to watch from the stands. This allowed Brett James and Tyson Edwards, who were also no small contributors themselves, to take their places. And of course, there was the injury to the most important man in South Australia. This was huge, but it also wasn't. Modra had a combined 16 disposals across the three finals, and went goalless for two of them. It was Bond and Jarman that provided the goals, and with no clear route to goal, St Kilda defenders Wakeland, Hudson, and Shanahan God, they had an awful backline. Well, they had no real number one target to try and quell. The Crows, though, were brewing one in Malcolm Blight's Frankensteinian lab devoted to tactic creation. The man they chose to replace a generational talent and probably the third best forward of the 90s was perhaps even less likely a full forward than a random passerby you'd pluck off the street. Allow me to introduce you to Shane Eller. Unbelievably, a defender with two first names was selected as the replacement for perhaps the greatest forward the Australian Football Club will ever see. He was a key back who had scored three goals in his 38 games prior to this day, and none this season, which soon changed as he got the first goal of the match. And then another, and then he got shifted back to half back, where he kicked three more. Ellen had never really shown any real forward prowess, any signs that he could dominate a game. And then he did, on the biggest stage in the country when the weight of expectation was riding him like, well, Tony Modra. It was something that could only really be fostered within this group of functionally unremarkable players, under the guidance of probably the greatest football mind at the time. 
Funnily enough, this move from Blight allowed David Pittman to walk onto the field that day, a man who Blight said this about after a subpar showing some 20 matches earlier. He went on to never be dropped again, providing Sean Wren with the backup he so badly needed across his injury-struck seasons. Ellen's efforts alone wouldn't be enough, though. St Kilda made worthy opposition, with Harvey recording 36 disposals and Austin Jones kicking one of the great grand final goals. However, Adelaide had a weapon to counter both of these magnificent players, Andrew McLeod. Embracing his new role he'd only learned the previous week, as a roaming midfielder, he amassed 11 marks and 31 disposals. He found freedom in the wide open MCG flanks, and in the final quarter, his endless supply to his forward line paid off in full. A 10 point margin at the final change turned into an onslaught. Now, Darren Jarman had been played as a midfielder most of the year. He drifted forward to put four past Sydney and seven past a hopeless Richmond, but today he'd been put in command of the Crows' forward line. He started poorly, but in the last term he put together the best quarter ever played in a Crows jersey. He starts with an easy one. He made Shanahan look like a statue in securing another. Easy start. He cranks up the difficulty with his third, roving from a Matty Roberts spoil. Dennis Cometti is hardly done singing his praises when the Saints double-team Nigel Smart, allowing the little rover to crumb on goal, his fourth in the quarter and fifth for the match. Ellen then matches him on five, but the greatest ball user of the 90s isn't going to be outdone by some balding backman. In it comes again. He's beaten in the contest, but not on the day, and that will do. The game is over. Jarman has ensured that. Only Tony Modra managed five goals in the quarter before him, and only one more will ever match it in a Crows jersey. Adelaide's skill in front of goal was the real game changer. 14 goals won in the second half they kicked, the most accurate half of goal scoring in a grand final. In fact, there have only been 11 halves of footy more accurate in history, with a sample size of 10 scoring shots or more. McLeod won the Norm Smith medal for best field, and Malcolm Blight was hailed as an SA hero. This, coupled with the Eagles' two flags and Sydney's resurgence, truly hailed the start of the AFL's expansion era, and it was about to get even better. The 1997 draft was the polar opposite to the draft prior. It was littered with future Brownlow medalists, best and fairest winners, and premiership players. So who then did Malcolm Blight draft? Ah, here we go. A man who played four games for us, a man who played in a side we beat by 139 points and was cut from that side, and... Oh god, Ian Perry! <coughs> In addition to getting that idiot Downsbrook, Adelaide decided to actually target a couple of decent players for once, maybe by accident. Reliable backman Nathan Bassett was brought in at the cost of some scraps, whilst swingman Mark Stevens joined from North Melbourne in a deal which would unfortunately begin Jason McCartney on the path to Dakota in Bali. Modra wouldn't be returning until later on in the 1998 season, and it turns out that Shane Ellen really wasn't a great forward. By round 10, and after only three goals scored in the one match, the whole Ellen experiment was declared over as the 1997 hero returned to the backline. Jarman, Vardy and Robran shared the load, but the Crows struggled for goals in general. With Bassett and Stevens, as well as Ellen after round 10, the defence turned an average 1998 start into a finals run. Adelaide won 9 of their last 12, heading into a do-or-die round 22 clash. The ramifications were huge. Lose, and with the wrong results, a premiership team could miss the finals the next year, which would be disastrous. Win, and they'd scrape into the finals by a mere 4 premiership points. Again, it was West Coast who would shape their September fate, and again, the Crows would win. Modra had a day out with four goals, but he reverted to his 1992 self after returning from the injury. This time, the Crows, if they were to win, would have to do it the hard way from fifth. They got belted in their opener to Melbourne, an act for a fifth place team that would end a finals run these days, but the weird system they used back then meant they had another chance. A semi-final date against a despondent Sydney, reliant on an ageing Tony Lockett. Adelaide's own talisman, Modra, had fallen out of form and out of favour with coach Blight, being dropped for this match after a six-disposal, one-goal performance in that first final. 
Peter Vardy filled in for him admirably, as he'd done throughout the season, kicking six goals, with Andrew McLeod returning to the half-forward flank and adding another three. This set up a repeat of the blockbuster 1997 preliminary final against the Bulldogs. The Bulldogs seemed to have an interesting strategy this time around, beat Adelaide's score of 93 from the previous year, and they'd win. Now, this is true if you don't let Adelaide score more than 93, and they kinda did. Matthew Robran and Andrew McLeod almost combined to beat the Dogs themselves with 13 goals. McLeod got 7 of those against Brownlow medalist Liberatore, and Sean Wren again beat Brownlow medalist Scott Wind. Simon Goodwin provided valuable inside toughness, and the Crows were set to face their toughest opponent yet. Now normally a team with 21 scoring shots to halftime is almost secured a victory. Not 1998 North Melbourne though. Their 6 goals 15 was woeful enough to keep Adelaide in it, and they pounced. Blight again swung changes at half time, Jarman was moved closer to goal like he was in 1997, Rashuto had a new role, and Ben Marsh, the man so nice he was rookie drafted twice, became one of the earliest examples of the resting Ruckman going forward. Rashuto had 12 touches in the last half, Jarman activated his 1997 last quarter mode and kicked 5 goals in that time, and Marsh, while still ineffective, provided the foil that Jarman and Smart needed to kick multiple goals. Blight enforced his players' physical dominance. Only 6 kangaroos would lay more than one tackle, and a further 9 wouldn't lay any. The Crows used their athletic defenders to wear out the North forwards. Peter Caven took on Wayne Carey, the greatest forward of the 90s, and kept him to only a single goal, one less than Silvani, the greatest defender of the 90s, would allow the next year. A five-goal third quarter allowed the Crows to draw level, and they kept that momentum with a six-goal final term. North in this period kicked two goals seven. For the match, they had 18 behinds against the win, and eight goals 22 overall meaning the Crows had again come from low down on the ladder to face the top team, fell behind, and then won, due in part to greater goal accuracy, with Andrew McLeod winning the Norm Smith medal again. In fact, these results, and Carlton making the 99 grand final from 6th, forced the AFL to streamline the final structure for 2000. To complete the sense of deja vu, Robert Harvey again won the Brownlow after the winner was ruled ineligible again. Funnily enough, 1997 hero Ellen had one more disposal in 1998 than he had goals in 97. Carlton didn't win the grand final in 1999, that super amazing North team did. But Adelaide's team was still up and coming, a full year younger on average than North's 1998 side. McLeod hadn't even played 80 games, and he'd won two Norm Smith medals. In fact, only five men who bore 1998 Premiership medals were over 27. They were on a roll with the best coach in the league at the helm. This run could last forever. It didn't. It never even looked like the Crows got out of first gear in 1999. In fact, the more they played, the more those Premierships seemed like outliers, like flukes. Those were the second and third times they'd ever even made the finals. The rest of the time, they were too mediocre without being poor enough to attract too much attention. Now, with the weight of actual expectations, they seemed to collapse. And there was one more thing. Tony Modra was gone. True to form for Blight's administration, he was traded for less than his worth, and the players we drafted from those picks, they were, well, they weren't Tony Modra. He left Adelaide as its leading goalscorer. 440 goals from only 118 games. He left as a hero, a football icon, a sex symbol, a Coleman medalist, a two-time All-Australian, and he left as one of four men to win Mark and Goal of the Year. But he left without a Premiership medallion. That match against Melbourne was his last, not a fitting send-off for Adelaide's finest. He went to Fremantle, where he pretty much secured the fact that he'd never win the ultimate prize. He kicked 71 goals for a team that finished second last with only four wins. He'd win Mark of the Year again in 2000 with another 50 goals under his belt for the second lowest scoring side that year. That ACL would dog him though as he retired at the end of 2001 citing knee issues. 
he'd end with 588 goals, 39th all time. Impressive since he debuted at 23. He gave us so much, but he deserves so much more. The trading of Tony Modro had a bigger impact than Blight really assumed. Rusciuto was the only player to average over 20 disposals, while Jarman shouldered all the weight up forward so he couldn't wander through the midfield to add to his influence. Rookie Brett Burton was the next best goal scorer with just under half of Jarman's tally. Just like their opponents in 1998, their tackling pressure wasn't there. They were last in that stat now, so not only could they not get the ball and hence not score, they couldn't stop the opposition when they had the ball. Their forwards, midfield and defence were all under par. Blight seemed to see the writing on the wall and fled to ruin St Kilda at the end of 1999, leaving Gary Ayres, former Hawthorne legend and victim of the Crows 1997 finals run, to take the helm. The Crows looked for a quick rise back up to power, trading two picks for Matthew Clark. This was a dumb move. There was talent enough in the draft to recruit a backup for the injury-prone dual premiership player in Sean Wren without having to trade two good picks for a ruckman, albeit a very good one. Case in point, they picked up a talented local young ruckman in Red Biglands, wasting a pick considering the Clark acquisition. If they'd purely gone down that Clark route, that 36th pick could have seen Ryan O'Keefe, Lindsay Gilby, Ben Johnson or Matty Whelan come to Adelaide. Throw Clark out the window, and picks 6 and 21 could have seen future Premiership players, 300 gamers, and club legends end up wearing blue, gold, and red. I'm imagining the 2005 Crows lineup with Robert Murphy and Brad Green in it. It's good, very good, and it could have happened. Thankfully, the Crows also made a less dumb trade, picking up Scott Walsh for the equivalent of a bag of chips, who would shape the forward line for the next decade. 2000, though, was an unremarkable season. Really, it was. I refuse to remark on it. The Crows limped again to 11th, a position the Crows had kind of made their own little home whilst not venturing out for unlikely Premiership Crusades. Under Reyes, though, there was change in the wind. Those young Premiership players hadn't even hit their prime yet. And when they did, oh boy, they were going to be good. You see, Bickley, Smart, Modro, Wren, Jarman, McLeod, even Caven, Ellen and Matty Liptak had had their moment. But one man still hadn't hit his zenith, and when he did, it wasn't only him that was unstoppable, it was the whole damn team. He took up the captaincy, and led the Crows into a bold new era. I'm pretty sure you've heard of it. Cheers for watching guys, hope you're enjoying the series so far, um, if you are, give the videos a like. Uh, the third part is hopefully coming out soon, it's uh, all about the Mark Rusciuto era at the Crows, so uh, subscribe if you want to be notified as to when that comes out, and I'll catch you guys soon.